My name is Giles Corran. I'm a writer, restaurant critic and lover of good food and fine wine. I'm being joined by writer, broadcaster and lover of cabbage and carrots, Sue Perkins, as we supersize our way through the diets of six different eras in Britain's history. Each week we'll be medically tested, dressed for the part and forced to work our way through the best and the worst of Britain's culinary past. Here's looking at you, maggot. This week we'll be stepping back in time to the home front of World War II, an era which many have blamed for ruining our national palate. Here we'll be bedding down in the tube with an air raid picnic. You don't know what else is in there. It's mostly carpet. What I'm saying is I did There's... trim my toenails last night. Tempting today's youth with some wartime classics. <laughs> and entertaining the GIs with some novelty nylons. If you don't mind a little bit of bristle, that's an incredibly tasty thing. From 1939 to 1945, Britain was at war. All men between the ages of 18 and 41 were called up, but luckily for Sue, I've got flat feet, so I'm staying in Blighty to defend her on the home front. At the outbreak of hostilities, Britain was importing 60% of its food from abroad, so German U-boats were ordered to blockade us out of the war. In the face of potential starvation, the government took control of Britain's food stocks and issued the nation with ration books. It was the housewife's national duty to keep her family fighting fit. So this week, Sue will be stuck in the kitchen, having to contend with our meagre rations and trying to keep this hungry husband happy. It's like cream strained through a tramp's hair, isn't it? I feel the word sorry should come out of my mouth. Before we march off to war, however, we're off to London's poshest gym and medical centre to find out just how fit we are to fight. Dr Asher is a specialist in sports and nutritional science. After taking our blood and weighing us, his team puts us through a set of rigorous tests. Culminating in an excruciating three minutes on a treadmill in a hypoxic chamber designed to test our fitness levels to their limits. I think I may be having a heart attack. That's like just running up like Kilimanjaro or something. Back in his office, Dr. Asher tells us the damage. These tests are those of a remarkably healthy young woman. I was not expecting it, but you are remarkably <laughs> healthy. But let's look at Sue's instead. From the look at me. Now. Uh, I have no doubt that you'll, you'll see that these are the results of a person who barely ever has a drink. Strangely enough, Giles, your Gamma GT, the alcohol reactive part of the liver test, is 37. Now, we accept 40. It's normal. Cool. But it's at the upper end of normal. Of course it is. Not like her nibs here, who was down at 14. That's pathetic. <laughs> I wasn't 14. I went, my level wasn't that low when I was nine. This wartime diet that you're about to do was scientifically devised to put people into a state of health, in fact, to put the whole population into a state of health. And I expect you to experience the same health benefits. So, so what else characterises this diet? What, what about it might I find unappealing? Psychologically, because we're not just machines, you may actually experience a feeling this is rubbish grey food, simply because it's not as exciting and fun. It's a greyish diet. So I might actually become miserable. My expectations of the week are dismal, largely based on the fact that I'm not going to be allowed to drink. It's going to be a high price to pay for a little bit of extra fitness. What I'm thinking is going to happen is I'm going to be sad and miserable because I can't have cakes every More day. More moody and sad. More yeah. moody and sad. But on the plus side, I will be able to swim to Normandy personally and liberate every man, woman and child. After our cheery visit to the doctor, we're ensconcing ourselves in a middle-class 1930s suburban semi and looking forward to our week of war. I'm just hoping we get bombed. So I can run out of the street in my pants. It wasn't just food, but clothes too, that were rationed on the home front. Due to shortages in material and labour, wartime fashion went utilitarian. So, to do my bit for Blighty, I'll have to put up with a distinctly unflattering wardrobe. This is horrid. I'm a civil servant on the average annual wartime salary of £600, the equivalent of £23,000 today. But with material shortages being so severe, even I can only buy one pair of pants a year. Luckily for me, I've inherited a pot of Brill Cream and my grandpa's suit. <laughs> I think this is what you call a technicolour minger. Pure technicolour minger. <laughs> You look handsome, you old fool. Look at you, it's going to suit you. Have you just come to do the cleaning? I, I, because I'm playing my wife in this it's one. It's horrible, horrible char lady 
Chavy chic. I, you look like my grandmother on cleaning day. The housewife was not alone in the wartime kitchen. Over six years of war, she would be bombarded with propaganda and recipe tips from the specially created Ministry of Food. Taking the place of the Ministry in order to help us through our week of austerity is chef and food writer Allegra McEvity. Hi. Morning. Morning, morning. So here's your ration books. But this belongs to Emily Hubbard. Yes, you can be. You She's can dead now. Oh, if you were really poor, these changed hands for a lot of money. You just went and flogged your whole book. This is one person's rations for a week. Well, she's only weighs one person's. This isn't for one both person's. people. One person's. No, no, the loo roll you have to share. <gasps> of course. At the same time. <laughs> Wartime weekly rations per person per week included two lamb chops, one ounce of cheese, and four ounces of special margarine laced with vitamins A and D. When Churchill saw it, he proclaimed it a lovely meal. Just that one. That is one for one person for one week. This is it. So this is going to be a big decision moment. When to crack open the, the golden ovum of the week. Vegetables, however, were unrationed. The big story this week is this. I know you're going to be happy with this. I'm so. very happy with that. So I can have as much of this stuff as I want. It's not rationed in any way. It's, it's not just... rationed in any way at all. At the end of the First World War, much of Britain had been left undernourished. This time round, the government was determined to get it right. The idea is that with this lot, you can really cook your way to victory. Mm, absolutely. Let's begin with a carrot. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah, we can do it with those, can't we? Yeah, you can bash the Bosch up a treat with that. Mm. To save the precious fuel ration, families were encouraged to take their breakfast in the kitchen and to listen to the Ministry of Food's radio broadcasts every morning at quarter past eight. We have a job to do together, you and I. We are the army that guards the kitchen front. Do you eat new bread? Yes. Because if you keep it a day longer, you know, it'll go further. And another very personal question. Are you eating wisely? Yes. We have enough pork, what is pork? for the time being. Pork. So there's my policy. Good. Now let me tell you where I want you. Breakfast, wheaters, national loaf, scrambled eggs, cup of tea. Britain imported 90% of its cereals from abroad, so not to be undone by a lack of shredded wheat, wartime housewives made Wheaties from stale bread cut into cubes and dried in the oven. That's nice, isn't it? As good as, as shredded. Look, basically I'm helping the Hun here by, by not using all of that. It's illegal to not eat everything on your plate, actually enforceable by time in prison, and people did spend time in prison because of not doing it. Can you imagine being banged up with a load of crims, and you, they say, what are you in for? And you go, I didn't eat my Wheaties. You now have the choice of scrambled eggs with either real egg, just that one that you've got, or powdered. I'm going to go for powdered egg. Yeah, I'm, I'm more interested in powdered egg too. I've never done one of these. Can I have them runny? No, I don't think you want them runny. I'm following the recipe on the side of the tin. That's two of these per person, so four of these. Oh, not very good whisking. With the majority of Britain's poultry flocks having been slaughtered to save on precious animal feed, dried eggs from America stoically took real eggs place. Ooh. Farty. That's got rank written all over it. To me, the really amazing thing is how little this has made. Mm. That's not the amazing no. thing about that for me. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> oh, this camouflage neatly onto that sort of banana-coloured plate. Remember I get more than her. Men have bigger rations all than right. me. I don't think she's going to fight you for it, Giles. <laughs> but if I did, I'd win. Can we have some butter, please? I can't eat special margarine no. actually on my bread. Hello, this is the thing. Rationing, OK? You can't just go, wench, get me some more pork and I'll have a sheep's head. The you cannot have more than what is on the table. You're going to have to deal with it the first time in your life. Boundaries, restrictions, want, need, necessity. Deal with it. I think I may go and fight. <laughs> yeah. I... mm, it doesn't really smell of anything at all, which eggs normally do. It's got this incredible chemical tang. But it tastes quite nice. I mean, it tastes, you know, it tastes all right. I like this. This is better than real eggs. By the end of the war, children were so used to the taste of dried eggs that they too preferred them to the real thing. I need bread. You nicked all my nuts. No! You nicked no! it all anyway. No, you can't have what it. What do you do around the house I'm, that I don't do? What I, are you doing so far? I, I burn two, two and a half thousand calories a day, not one and a half thousand. Sitting in a tank top. How many calories does that burn? Wearing viola. <laughs> Since the war began, the government have received countless inquiries from men of all ages who wish to do something for the defence of their country. Well, now is your opportunity. It wasn't just on the front line in France that men could defend their country. Determined to prove myself to Sue, after breakfast I head out of the house to sign up for war duty with the Home Guard. Morning, your Private Perkins. Indeed, Morning, Private Corrin. It was also compulsory for married women under 40 to sign up for war work. Despite not being allowed to join the Home Guard, Sue's desperate to play her part. I just hope she doesn't let me down. Well, don't drop God, it's heavy. 
Known today from Dad's army, the Home Guard was formed in the face of the biggest threat ever known to the British Isles. After the fall of France in June 1940, the German army was readying itself for a full-blown invasion, with British news reports predicting that Nazi paratroopers would drop from the skies, masquerading as nuns and tram drivers. Thrown in the deep end with the drill, it seems we're a long way off from being a fighting unit. Damn! Private Perkins go on to more advanced training without Private Corrin, sir. Uh, we're going to stay here until Private Corrin gets here. <laughs> <laughs> one, two, three. One, two, one, two, three. Two, three. One. one. Wrong arm, Private Corrin. <laughs> Shall I uh, put How Private Corrin out of his the... misery, sir? <laughs> Lunch, potato sandwiches, jam sandwiches, tea. So this is, this is proper home guard fare, this, is it? This was our home guard fare. So having worked all morning, and uh, you'd be entitled now to your mug of tea, with what looks like a national loaf to me. It is national loaf, indeed. That's pretty dismal, that is. Made from 85% wholemeal flour and laced with vitamins and iron, national loaf was nicknamed Hitler's secret weapon by a public hooked on white bread. If you have any body fluid left, that will soak it up. That really would, wouldn't that? Mm. Come in. It's stodgy and it gets you through, doesn't it? Mm. That's all I had. So this is going to sustain us, is it? Is this... It will certainly keep you, the carbohydrates will keep you supplied with energy after be racing around, fighting uh, the Hun with the bayonet. And the great thing is, is that when you finish your potato sandwich or whatever's left, you can just scrunch it into a ball okay. and just use it for grenade practice. Back at home, it's time to put our feet up. Well, it is for me. Sue's back where she belongs, in the kitchen, cooking my supper. We're cooking ourselves to victory, victory, victory. Now, some people say that was a one with uh, guns, knives, bravado, and unflailing human spirits. You're saying to me that the war is won by cauliflower. Cauliflower, root vegetables, and predominantly Lord Walton's pie. Named after the Minister of Food himself, Walton pie, made from root vegetables and a potato and oatmeal pastry, became the most famous recipe of the war. To cajole the public into eating more victorious vegetables, the Ministry came up with the cartoon characters Potato Pete and Dr Carrot. Potato Pete was such a success that despite rationing, by 1944 the average intake of calories had risen to 3,010 per day. Potatoes, new potatoes, old potatoes in a salad cold. Enjoy them all, including chips, remembering spots don't come in chips. We won the war. It's true. Oh, I've just trodden this. I tell you what, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to eat that. Nothing, <laughs> nothing. No waste. Is. Absolutely, Jar won't know anyway. <sighs> Looking good. Yeah. And this literally is the dish that won the war. And do you know how? They laid it basically like mines on the bottom of the sea. I think a little bit more respect for the pie, to be honest, Suze. He, uh, he... Yeah, I, I think the pie is, do you know what? In all seriousness, I think the pie is brilliant. It's simple, it's really good healthy ingredients. Giles will hate it. Dinner, Fulton pie, oatmeal sauce, raw cabbage salad, nip of sherry, beer. Right. I'll tell you what, let's, let's have a toast. How about that? I've got, for some reason, a, I've got a lady sherry. Two. Two. Sir Winston. Sherry and wine were unrationed, but were so hard to get hold of that one thrifty housewife made a single bottle of sherry last the entire war. It looks like Sue's will be lucky to last the week. This is thing made entirely from vegetables. I had a breakfast of scrambled eggs, which barely even counts as an egg. My lunch was potato sandwiches, and I, th I mean, this is an entirely meat-free day. And I think it's, a, it's slightly depressing. It'd be okay. nice if it had some meat in it, don't you think? No. I'm doing that. I mean, there must be equally as plague of squirrels then as now, and if you were to just, just, uh, just chuck one squirrel in there... Well, you really think that putting a squirrel in that would help it? Hmm. A rat or something? I'm so glad you weren't in control of you. It would be chaos. Lord Corrin's rat pie. I would have been one of the most popular men in We Britain. would have been in... But I tell you what, we'd have succumbed to the Blitz. Gull, Goebbels would be gull sitting... Gull you could put in. What? Gull. Seagull. Why would you want to put a gull in a pie? Before we can launch into our first wartime argument, dinner is dramatically interrupted. Sorry, that's the cabbage. Absolutely plays havoc. I think it's air raid, sorry. Should I be coquettish and girly and just naff off to the uh, set of covers? I'll have your, uh, have your pastry. After losing the Battle of Britain in July 1940, Germany abandoned plans to invade, deciding to bomb us into submission instead. No Hun is going to chase me from my dinner. 
On the 7th of September, the first night of the Blitz, 500 enemy bombers filled London's skies and dropped over 100,000 bombs. Over the next nine months, when the bombers' moon lit up the city, 2,000 fires would start every night, causing the biggest conflagration since the Great Fire in 1666. Fire watching was compulsory for men between the ages of 18 and 60, so I make the lonely trek into town to do my duty. If a bomb goes, I'm not actually sure what I'm supposed to do. I've got binoculars, so I can, I can... No, that's fine, it's a pigeon. If a bomb does go off, and like the next building over there goes into flames, fortunately, I've got this bag of sand. From here, just a little bit of sand. Here you go, nasty bomb. That'll put it out. I can do about, I can do about 30 bombs with that sand. If we do get bombed, though, it might be a blessed release from the diet, which uh, comprises spam corned beef carrots to help me see in the dark, Ovaltine and bread. My hands are too cold to open the spam. Did they bomb us in winter? Although if they had any sense they would bomb us in the cold because probably everyone's just inside warming themselves by the fire. In the summer it was lovely to come up here, bring your girlfriend. Bit of rumpy pumpy. Here, come on darling, have a spam sandwich, watch the bombs. This is my only bit of meat of the day, so it had better be good. That is the word minging not coined for another 50 years. It meant they were unable to describe the taste of spam and so they carried on eating it. Spam was shipped over from America as part of the Lend-Lease Agreement of 1941. Over five years, $31 billion of war material was sent to our shores, including 45,000 tonnes of Spam. They put the whole pig in a blender, mashed it into the tin. Ooh, and there's a jelly in there. You get a sense of the deprivation of, of the time because they actually, you know, they looked forward to the, the, the Spam meal of the week. They really got a, got a flavour for it. It's an astonishing gap between my lifestyle and the lifestyle of those happy few, that band of brothers who, who saved us. It looks like it's going to be a long night. I'm worried that Giles isn't taking the war effort seriously enough, and so I thought, uh, just for the good of the nation, that what I'd do is, um, I'd, uh, I'd have the chops. Um, yes, they're rationed, but he doesn't need meat, you know, it'll slow him down, you know. If he's got to take on the Hun at close range, you can't be doing it without, mmm, that's a nice lamb chop. Mmm. Mm, that's good. Oh. After a sleepless night, we were up early on the allotment. In wartime Britain, growing your own became a national duty. Under the campaign Dig for Victory, playing fields, rooftops and bomb sites all over the land were turned over to cabbage and curly kale. By 1943, there were 1.4 million allotments in cultivation, each producing seven pounds of vegetables every week. After her night with the pie, even Sue's thinking of other ways to put our vegetables to good use. Wear well, that as an enormous corsage. So I'm dragging her into town in the hope of getting some decent grub. Originating as an emergency system for feeding people who'd been bombed out, the so-called British restaurant provided unrationed food for war workers and the general public. They were initially called communal feeding centres, but Churchill vetoed the name, saying it was suggestive of communism. So, skilly, tuppers, tuppers. None of those British restaurants survives today, but John Lewis has agreed to feed us a wartime victory meal in its staff canteen, where food is subsidised for their workers today. This is the uh, skilly, but remember there's a sign that goes with the soup that just says, keep calm. Skilly was a hated soup, made from grated carrots and homegrown oatmeal. Once you'd eaten something like this, that the... Right. That there'd be no fear about the incoming hordes. You'd experience real fear with the cuisine. I have a bit of meat. In this sea of beige food, something bright and colourful catches our eye. Or banana. No bananas! Once Britain's favourite pre-war fruit, bananas totally disappeared from Britain's shelves. Right, we've just got these... Uh, we haven't got any bananas. There's no fruit. We haven't had the fresh fruit. Victory. Victory. Lunch. Skilly. Cottage pie, carrots and swede, apple crumble. Keep calm and keep going. Something is creamy, it's hot. This is the kind of anemic food I've been getting at home, so I'm ditching it and moving on to the first dish of the week that's actually fit for a man. What is exciting oh. is this. Oh. Now that is a pie. Until we came here, I was really baffled by this statistic that the British ate out more 
between 1940 and 1945 than they ever had before. But th the truth is, they obviously did it because it was the only time you ate well. Exactly. That was the age of the restaurant, the age of the restaurant critic. I'd have been so happy then. With a subsidised three-course meal costing the equivalent of only £1.50 today, a hungry public was soon eating four meals a week away from home. The thing for me, as a housewife, called upon to use just a minimal amount of ingredients, all of which are rationed, you get to come here and the pressure's off. You can let someone else take the slack, sit down, and actually we can have a conversation. Do you know, it's, it's more convenient. Yeah, we can flirt. Chat. I mean, yeah. They said it'll be over by Christmas. That's what they say. Not a war of attrition, but a war of nutrition. Oh, they, they could make a poster about that, if the war wasn't over. Yeah, and if you were the Minister of Food, instead of a bloke who, who basically dodged subscription, which I will keep on mentioning. We've got to move on to the crumble. Yeah. We uh, haven't got any custard. No, shall I go and get some? We'll sort it with that fellow. Can we have a spoon of your custard, would you mind? Have a spoon of my custard. There's wartime now, spirit. Fabulous. Very good. Yeah, we mustn't... I'm so sorry about my husband. Wartime he, uh, spirit. I don't let him out of his cage very often. I'm Crumble was the greatest of all wartime inventions, created by thrifty housewives faced with too little butter to make pastry. But my eyes seem to be bigger than my dwindling belly. I've been at war for two years. My belly has shrunk. I thought I could eat that much. I can't. How are we supposed to win the war if you leave? You've left that, you've left that, you've left that. Do you know what? I'm sick of this. I could go to prison for your gluttony. We are taking all of this home. It is all, you are having it for your tea, whether you like it or not. The whole lot is going in. Clear plate, clear conscience. Right, act normal, even though you're not. I want the banana, that's the thing I really should enjoy. Back at home, it's time to put up the blackout blinds. From two days before the war began, Britain plunged itself into darkness for five years. The blackout was enforced so strongly that one housewife was fined for ironing in the dark because the pilot light on her iron was visible from the street. Amusing oneself in blackout became a national obsession, with best-selling books suggesting cheery games and activities to enliven the soul. So to raise our spirits, we've got Allegra back in the kitchen and we've decided to have some fun with wartime food. There's a difference between what I'm going to be making and what, what it's going to be called. I mean, this is a real freak show of fakery. To alleviate the monotony of their meagre rations, housewives came up with a series of morale-boosting mock recipes. A lot of the, you know, the times it was to do with perception of luxury, you know, sort of special. So the idea is to, you know, try and trick people sort of subliminally into thinking they're actually eating something that was much less than it was. There is no way they're going to guess what this is. Dinner. Mock crab with mock mayonnaise, mock duck, mock apricot tart with mock cream, mock coffee. First course of delights. Hang on, let me... Uh... Ah, 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 don't do that! What? Where are they? <laughs> <laughs> it's a piece of toast with something on it. And here is a little sauce. Ah, okay. This is children's and... party game in the face of the hung. First up is mock crab, made from margarine, dried eggs, vinegar, cheese and salad cream. Right. That's jam with Chanel number no. five and Ugh No it's, it's like not. an eye socket. It's served in an eye it's socket. It's Holland's mayonnaise that has it's... been passed once through a goose. Next is mock duck, made from sausage meat, onion, grated apple and sage. And then she just very nicely says, and then just shape it into a duck. <laughs> like everyone knows how to shape sausage meat into a duck. Hey ho, this is how we won the war. Whack, 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 whack. Oh, that's horrid. Ah, oh. I'll leave you to that one for a minute. It's really nice. It's just a scotch egg. So what Sausage is it? A meat. mock? It's a mock. Mock roast leg of pork with um, sage and onion stuffing. And basically, there'll be some toasted loo paper for crackling. If the whole of Britain was at home doing this, the Germans would have no trouble invading, would they? Absolutely we not. Wouldn't even need guns. We, we have come. We They're all in their houses. <laughs> 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 we just walk straight through. I don't like what they're eating, though. <laughs> Last but not least, mock apricot tart, made from grated carrots, almond essence and plum jam, and served with mock cream, that is, margarine, sugar and flour. All this mock food is beginning to make me feel like a mock chef. <laughs> that's a mock belt, oh, sorry about dear, that. Oh dear, oh dear. Wasn't about, that was a, that was a, I made that from air. That's mock change the atmosphere. Oh dear. Uh, how come the, um, so how did you do on this one? It was rank. That was mock roast pork. It wasn't mock rank, it was real rank. It mock was... stuffed roast pork. 
It was blatantly mock duck. What? <laughs> it's sausage meat. <laughs> it was an ironic chef joke. This one's decent. It's fruit tart with a special blob on top. Oh. <laughs> no, that's chef speak, isn't it? Is it like icing or? The blob tastes like very, very it's wet, nice. sugary paste. Cream, mock cream. I think it's mock pastry made from venison <laughs> with a mock cream. This is the thing, this is the whole war thing, it's double bluff. We need someone from Bletchingly in to decode what the hell this is. It's mock steak and chips, yeah. we've just been blindfolded so long that we can't tell. Did you get it? Did you get it? Yes. Mock apple pie with mock cream. Mock cream correct, mock apricot pie. No. Okay. Ah. Ah. If this is the world I don't want to see anymore, look at that. <laughs> I'd rather have sausage and a carrot, frankly, than just than pretend it's duck and apricot. <laughs> After dinner, what better than a game of Monopoly? Seven. Six and six. No, two and six. Stuck at home in the blackout, home front husbands and wives spent more time with each other than ever before. And only two days in, we're already feeling the strain. I don't need a million dollars to make my dreams come true. For a Chinese deep fried prawn balls with the glowy orange sauce, some chili, some chili, some garlic, some onion, something with a bit of flavour. Not that, not cabbage leaves. It's day three on the home front, and the blitz is over. After two years of drudgery and darkness, I'm determined to spice things up. So I've asked some new boys over for lunch, the GIs. Apparently, uh, GIs thought the British women smelt and had bad teeth, uh, so they obviously met us. You know, I'm hoping to get something out of it. It's pure selflessness that's driven me to the makeup table today, you know. I'm hoping for some nylons, some cigarettes, a child, and some pineapple chunks, in that order. In 1941, America entered the war, and within a year, one million American GIs had invaded Britain. With their fancy uniforms and jive and jazz, the women of Britain suddenly perked up. Like everything else on the home front, makeup was in such short supply that I'm having to get creative. After slapping some bicarb on my armpits and pasting my face with some beet juice, not think I've ever done that. But, you know. It's time for the finishing touch. I'd feel like an idiot going out like this without properly doing my legs. Now nylons were in very short supply, you had to do unspeakable things with GIs to get them. And uh, it, so, to create the look of tan tights, gravy browning, work that into the leg like that. Can I just say that the normal tights don't give you anything like the sensory pleasure of this? To be able to smell your own tights, that's the thing, that's, they've missed a trick there, they really have. One unfortunate side effect of gravy stockings was that hungry dogs would chase housewives down the street. And to add the finishing touches to my outfit, what better than a bit of boot polish? It's rare I say this, but I feel truly beautiful inside and out. I'm really ready to face the GIs, and I think they're going to be very, very, very pleased at what a great show an English lady can put on. With all the kerfuffle upstairs, we're running late for our visitors. In wartime Britain, it usually took losing one's wife to a bomb to get a man in the kitchen. But, luckily for Sue, I'm stepping into the breach. Overpaid, oversexed, and over here. The GIs earned eight times what a British soldier did, so I'm doing my bit for our boys with a spot of sabotage. When it comes to it, she wants me to put this, which is the last lard that we have through. I don't know what she's going to, you know, fry my egg in tomorrow, my one egg. So I'm just buggered if I'm putting that in the, uh, if I'm putting that in the, uh, in the cake. But fortunately, what I do have is some paraffin. Uh, and, and paraffin, as everyone knows, is a, a sort of a fat substitute. It can be used. In, in the war, it was occasionally used. Using liquid paraffin became so popular that the Ministry of Health issued warning leaflets about its very particular effects. They didn't use much of it because it was a mild laxative. This cake recipe, for example, calls for, if you're going to use it, two tablespoons of, uh, of paraffin. That's five. Then they'll bite into it and they'll taste and it'll be disgusting, which would be quite fun. Because, frankly, Sue has put so much effort into all this cooking. You know, are the Americans going to have the decency to disguise their revulsion? Are they going to pretend to like it? Because the tin does need to be greased. <laughs> 
They may look like Buzz Lightyear and his accountant, but today we're receiving two fighter pilots from RAF Mildenhall, Major Andy Homburg and Captain Kelly Bolan. Concerned about a culture clash between the swanky Yanks and war-weary Britain, the American War Office published a book of instructions to keep their troops in line. Don't make fun of British speech or accents. You sound just as funny to them, but they'll be too polite to show it. Never criticize the king or queen. And the British don't know how to make a good cup of coffee. You don't know how to make a good cup of tea, so it's an even swap. Lunch. Lettuce and margarine sandwiches. Mock hamburgers. American pinwheels. Lemon sponge. Custard. Ersatz coffee. Hello. 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 Do help yourself. Okay. Thank you very much. Sue and I are feeling mischievous and decide to put our guests to the test. What do you think of our royal family? <laughs> well, <laughs> certainly you laugh well. at the king. I would never laugh at the king. We can you stand up when we talk about the king. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really have an opinion on. Yeah, that. you don't have an opinion on the king. Well, yeah. That's what they said about them being. <laughs> Despite our goading, they seem to be on their very best behaviour. Let's see if they criticise the food. Would you like some coffee? Coffee. Would you like some coffee? Some coffee would be lovely. Yes, please. Erzat's coffee, made from roasted chicory and dandelion root, went down notoriously badly with visiting GIs. Let's see if these dudes like it. This is probably the best cup of coffee I've had in England <laughs> <laughs> for a while. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think it's about time I tried them with my paraffin cake. And the cake is very good. Yeah. Oh, there's plenty more where that came from. Mm, it's it's delicious, this cake. Don't eat the cake. What's you wrong must, with the cake? You mustn't eat it. it. Oh, no. It seems the cake is going down a bit too well with the wrong person. What do you mean you're quite a nice to book? I remember that birthday cake the other year when everyone was... <laughs> Diarrhea Dan's birthday surprise. <laughs> Cake's off anyway, so don't feel you've got to, uh, no. got to go ahead with that. <clears throat> the cake is very good. So much for my sweet revenge. Now desperate for her nylon, Sue goes on a charm offensive. Going khaki-wacky was an expression used to describe British women going doolally in the face of GIs in uniform, and it seems to be catching. Oh. you regret that. <laughs> oh, if you don't mind a little bit of bristle, that's an incredibly <laughs> tasty thing. Now that we've used up all of our precious rations on their spread, let's hope the GIs come up trumps. Really, we can't have you putting that on, on your legs anytime, yeah. so... And this is the... Feel free to do this later, not now, but... <laughs> Let me see this. Oh, it's so good. They're this as is, good as they say. Darling, I think... Yeah. Darling, we're saved. We're saved because now I can rob a bank. <laughs> At last, our, our cares are over. And after the nylons, a can of pineapple. There you go. Congratulations. Have yeah, fun. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank, you. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't know what to say other than um, it's probably time you went now. The arrival of the GIs put a great strain on many British marriages. I love America. Is it from pineapple? No. Good. By 1945, 80,000 British women had become GI brides. Half an hour of the GI they've given me, more than you've given me in five years. Paraffin. If the war isn't dangerous enough without having to introduce petroleum-based confectionery into your diet, that added free son of, am I about to go to the toilet again for the 50th time? And the answer to that is yes, so excuse me. Having wasted all our precious rations on the GIs, today I'm heading out into the fields in search of some free food with local forager Ian Burrows. So, quintessential English country lane. Yes. What can we get from it to eat? Well, we can get some of the best things, uh, like nettles. This old, old dead stuff here is covering the, uh, the new growth, and this is absolutely perfect for uh, what we want to do to make nettle soup. This is the only soup, of course, where you uh, scream all the way making it. It's only pain. When I'm making a soup, pain isn't one of the ingredients. Oh, it is in this one. Take an ounce of suffering, pinch of... Ow! That really hurts! And there you go. Yeah. For those living in the country, it was much easier to supplement one's rations. So, to help us on our way, we'll be consulting the countryman's wartime bible, They Can't Ration These. Written by the glamorous-sounding Vicomte de Modi, it proposes a return to nature's larder as a matter of national defence. Right, what are we looking for here? We've got crab apples. This is a lemon juice substitute. Oh! Oh! Oh, there was something proteinous in it. Oh! oh! I've just eaten the head of a maggot. Oh, good. Oh, oh God. We're still wiggling. 
With Sue safely out of the house, I've snuck out on some patriotic war duty of my own. I've headed off to the cabinet war rooms deep beneath Whitehall to find out how Churchill survived the war. From these dark corridors and pokey rooms, Churchill coordinated the fight against Hitler, but they also hid another secret. <laughs> His lavish wartime dinners washed down with buckets of Paul Roger vintage champagne. Very lucky here to have the uh, 1928. It was his favourite vintage. He'd have half a bottle at lunchtime and a bottle, sometimes a bottle and a half at dinner. Although subject to rationing like everyone else, in private, Churchill ate and drank like a lord, which of course he was. If he was having a meal, it would generally be champagne rather than uh, most wines. He'd burp a lot of things, I mean, <laughs> a, a, couple, a couple of glasses of it. This so relates so many things about <laughs> Winston Churchill, but I don't think uh, we can <laughs> tell uh, that one. You don't hear it in the recorder. <laughs> you certainly don't. No, no, no. Lunch. Native oysters, petite marmite, roast venison with mushrooms, ice cream and raspberries, Stilton. Apples, grapes and walnuts, Paul Rogers champagne, Chardonnay, Claret, Port, cognac, cigars. Tucking into a first course of oysters in Churchill's private dining room, I'm intrigued by how he thought he could get away with it. He was somebody who, of course, as the grandson of the Duke, was expected, really, to have a splendid lifestyle. And he appreciated, I think, that people didn't in any way uh, despise him for that, in a way that perhaps today, were a politician to have such a, uh, a fabulously um, splendid lifestyle, it would be held against well, they him. they do hate him. The Deputy Prime Minister can't have two cars. <laughs> 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 So as you say, there wasn't any bad feeling about him having better things than everyone else? Nobody knew about it, of course, yeah. because the uh, press was, uh, was very uh, heavily regulated apart. Uh, my, my view, and I think the, uh, the general one, is that if um, Winston Churchill, during the Second World War, didn't have the right to drink 1870 brandy, mm. then who the hell in history <laughs> ever, ever has had the right? After my mouthful of maggot, I ditch Ian and turn my hand to the Vicon's chapter, Food from the Fields. I was very much interested after listening to a broadcast from the BBC on the subject of grass as food. So he's basically saying that grass is a most delightful meal, proving, as we already knew, that the French don't know much about cuisine. Having thought about the vast variety of words I could use to bring to bear on the taste of grass, I have to conclude, well, for three mouthfuls. It's grassy. Yeah, it really is as grassy as one would imagine. I have to say, though, after a while, it's actually quite vorish. It's a workout for the jaw, and that takes a bit of doing, but you get there in the end, you get there in the end, and this is what the war spirit's about. It's not known how many wartime housewives took up the Vicon's challenge, but today I've learned what every cat and dog in the country already knows, that grass is indigestible. Deep under Whitehall, a stonking saddle of roast venison arrives. You forgive me having um, massive portions, but bear in mind that I'm living on rationing. Uh, <laughs> with, 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 I'm, I'm very heavily rationed. I think better get a couple more. On. <laughs> I don't know what you chaps are going <laughs> to... So what will your wife be eating tonight? She'd be eating hunted squirrel. Yeah, yeah. My vegetarian wife is out in the wild of Norfolk. She's hunting. Well, hunting. <laughs> She'll be making a massive fuss. And, and I couldn't bear to hear the whinging, so I came to town to see what Churchill and the boys were up to. <laughs> <laughs> Having abandoned the grass, I'm back at Ian's house looking forward to a proper lunch. Only to discover he's got more gruesome things in store. And all we need to do is crack them open and pull the shell off. Try and pull the shell off. Is it's it dead it. now? It's pretty dead now. Pretty dead isn't great, though, is it? No. no a definitive answer would make me well, feel more assured at this point. Very soon it's going to be absolutely dead. It's just going to go into, uh, into water. One or two more. I'm the snail equivalent of, uh, of, sort of Oscar Schindler here. You will not come for these ones here. All right, I will. I will. I've never eaten snails before. I sort of feel a bit squimish about it, but at the same time, you know... Why not? They're abundant, really abundant, and let's, let's kill them, but not these two. Not Sheila and Douglas. Lunch. Snail and nettle consomme, rabbit casserole with ear fungus, steamed Alexander Bracken. This is an extraordinary sort of buffet here. You've got lovely vegetables here, you've got protein in the form of a rabbit that was shot this morning, and you've got fat or carbohydrate, maybe sugar, who knows what a snail tastes like. 
Because if I didn't know what they were, I'd think, ooh, lovely little button mushrooms. But button mushrooms, they're not. We've gone from this to this, which means that this snail is quite literally staring death in the face. It's weird. I'll happily eat grass all day long, but the idea of a snail... Oh, dear. Oh, dear. That's worse than I'd thought. That's absolutely... There was a crunch there. Hadn't been properly shelled. Oh, God. Oh, dear. Oh, oh. You know when you rock when you eat, it's not a good sign. It's not leaving, it's not going anywhere. <laughs> it's actually creating a sort of quite panicky sensation. You've got to accept the positive view. Mind it to negative, black charm. <laughs> After two further courses of ice cream and Stilton and port, Immortal memory. I'm ready for a final Churchillian touch a cognac and a fat cigar. Oh, Churchill would be doing all this with it by now. Churchill loves cigars. He's made thousands and thousands of them. But he didn't inhale. He's often um, accused nowadays of being a non smoker by mm. Churchill revisionists, but he did enjoy the taste and the smell and the presence of a, uh, of a great cigar. Churchill's cigar became such an important symbol of the resistance against tyranny that MI5 tested them on mice for sabotage. Cigars and me don't usually mix, but I'm so trolly, I'm puffing away for England. It must have been a pretty... Uh, Pretty smoky atmosphere down there. These walls were painted white, weren't they? In the front, <laughs> <isn't it? laughs> Aware that Sue is at home waiting for me, I stagger off into the night. I can see the point where rationing is meant to make the populace feel good and it's meant to be healthy and keep their morale up. At the same time, you can see why Churchill, you can see why the man who was leading us had to eat better than that. I've got no guilt about Sue now. If she's out in the forest looking for mushrooms and squirrels, that's the little bit she can do to win the war. But, you know, I'm a man. I need red meat. I need champagne. I've got serious work to do. That cigar made me puke. Ooh. I've just yacked it up. Uh, I guess on the plus I don't have a hangover tomorrow. Maybe that's what it was with Churchill. Maybe that's what those cigars were about. Everyone wonders how did he drink eight bottles of champagne a day or whatever and still win us the war. It's because he puked every night. That's why he took those cigars. But how are you today? And how is the stomach? Is it firm and steady or a little windy? After a rough night, I've got Sue up early and am determined to get into top shape. Government manuals and radio broadcasts offered endless advice to weary home fronters about how best to keep fighting fit. Housewives were encouraged to take air baths. Husbands and wives were recommended to take brisk eight-mile walks in neighbouring streets. And any and all household implements were commandeered to keep one mobile enough for duty. What a wonderful symphony to the day! Oddly, as we get towards the end of the week, I'm feeling, you know, amazing. Really strange, really kind of flushed. Uh, I mean, flushed through in the, rather than flushed. I think it's to do with just having less animal fat, less protein, less kind of lumpy. In June 1944, the Allies launched the invasion of Normandy, D-Day. Finally, we've got something to celebrate. As wave upon wave of soldiers stormed the Normandy beaches, this would be the first time for almost four years that Allied troops had set foot on the continent en masse. With nothing but a can of corned beef at home, I'm leaving jars at the pub to go shopping for our celebratory Sunday lunch. For many housewives, the daily shop became a battle of nerves, with the committed food hunter resorting to any tactic for precious extras. As favourite brands disappeared from the shelves, the government replaced them with stocks of whale meat and a hated tinned fish from South Africa called Snook. If all else failed, there was always the Spiv. Dressed in his wide lapelled suit and trilby hat, he was a one-stop shop for extras on the black market. If you ever brought something unusual back home, families were briefed never to ask where it came from or how you got it. However repulsive it is, just cutting into a sheep's heart, this is what they did, and they wouldn't have batted an eyelid. And actually, they've been lucky to get it. So, you know, much as the modern me is repulsed, 
you know, the 1940s me just thinks, you know, come on, crack on. You know, as well as rules about what you can and can't cook, there were rules sort of like table etiquette. So, under no circumstances were you supposed to come to the table and tell your family what the dish was and tell they'd eaten it and that it was all right. Then you could say, ha yeah, it was a heart with some beef still in. Yeah, it was. At the height of rationing, Gallup surveyed the nation for their ideal Sunday lunch. Their fantasy food? Soul, roast chicken, trifle, cheese and biscuits, wine and real coffee. So I'm giving it my best shot. Sunday lunch. Snook piquant, braised sheep hearts, wartime trifle, sherry, red wine. It's the most extraordinary thing I've ever created. You're not going to be disappointed. It's mesmerising. It's unbelievable. It's unspeakable delight. It's snook again, isn't it? I'm not allowed to tell you what it is until you've tried it. I think it doesn't taste an awful lot, the snook. This is wartime. You think they could be turning their nose up. I actually think it's rather nice. I must say, by the way, it's a beautiful little display, the raw potato like flower it? display. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got sent a bunch of them as a thank you by our next-door <laughs> neighbour. Thank you for what? Look, I had to get the snook somehow. Thank God he doesn't know what I had to go through to get the hearts. Good Lord. OK, there I go. Oh, that's really nice. That's OK, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, it tastes like cheap waffle. It tastes like pig's liver. But, you know, nice. What was all the fuss about? Well, I suppose it just it wasn't what they conceived of for a Sunday. I finished mine. Is there another one? No, it's my next one. I can't eat it all. No, I don't want to steal your heart. It's too late. <laughs> it's too late. <laughs> oh, you last go. Christmas you gave me your heart. And the very next day you gave it away, and I told you not to give it to her. It was her down the road, number 32, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Don't do that again. It humiliated me. Just as I'm about to tuck into the trifle, lunch is cut dramatically short. A week after D-Day, and there was a new threat over London skies. Hitler's real secret weapon, the V-1 rocket. Known as doodlebugs, these pilotless bombs were launched from 140 miles away and were the most feared weapon of the war. To relieve the stress of the doodlebug onslaught, I'm taking Sue out of the house for a picnic in Marble Arch tube station. Mrs. Still had a lot of socks to men. So At the height of the Blitz, 177,000 people had sheltered in the tube every night. And now London has fled to it once again. <laughs> Popular neurosis had it that V1 rockets were fitted with poison gas. So today we're taking no risks. It's just really claustrophobic, hot. You look like a satanic womble. Thank you. I was going for uh, the dark side of Great Uncle Bulgaria. <laughs> I think a spot of tuck is in order. Supper, cheese and crackers, turnip soup, wartime sausages, cocoa. Mm, Ooh. sausages. That doesn't look like a sausage. Mm. It doesn't smell like a sausage. Three percent meat. Can I just have a little taste? They call it the uh, sweet mystery of life, what went into a sausage. Who knew? Carpet, mostly. Sausages were unrationed, but there was so little meat in them that they became a national joke. Containing little but gristle and bread, housewives never knew whether to put mustard or marmalade on them. You're eating the cheese without asking me. I'm eating sausages, which are off ration. You took cheese my nice vegetarian soup and rationed. dunked pig meat into it. No, they're actually, I think as discussed, there is only 3% pig meat in one of these sausages. You don't know what else is in there. It's mostly carpet. What I'm saying is I did There's... trim my toenails last night. Sheltering in the tube was an uncomfortable business. There were few toilets, disease was rife, and commuters had to step over shelterers on the crowded platforms. To keep up morale, cheery Londoners played games, sang songs, and even held fancy dress parades. Surely you're toast, aren't you? <laughs> no way. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> I can't believe I lost. <laughs> One benefit for husbands was that they could snuggle up to a stranger instead of their wife for the night. Ready for sleep? Yeah. I can play cards. For the first time in my life, I think I could accurately be described as stocky or sturdy or redoubtable. I mean, I know that women during the Second World War put on a dress size, but the war lasted six years. I managed to do that in a week. Yesterday morning at 2.41, A.M. General Jodl, the representative of the German High Command, signed the act 
of unconditional surrender. It's our final day in wartime Britain, and it's Victory Day. We may allow ourselves a brief period of rejoicing. After 2,073 days of war, Britain finally was at peace. To celebrate, we're holding a victory party and have invited our entire street. Victory parties were children's time, but everyone was determined to give them one happy day to blot out the misery of the last six years. Streets and village halls across the nation suddenly sprang into life. Bunting was taken off ration, and housewives rediscovered secret stashes of food that they'd been hoarding in anticipation. To help us out with the catering, we've asked Allegra back to cook up some V-Day classics. The big story here is that icing was illegal during the war. So this yep. is incredibly exciting. It was considered wasteful. But now the war's over and we can waste and we can enjoy and we can ice our cake. Although it is still illegal. This is underground icing. Yeah. Having been denied sugar for the whole week, I'm making up for lost time. You're going to regret that. That's a man who hasn't seen icing for a few years. Yep. He's going to take Giles off to the diabetes unit now. <laughs> And I think we're nearly ready to uh, give our, our community a good time. Here we go! Food that day was such as many children had never seen before in their lives. Victory lunch. Victory scotch eggs, pilchard sandwiches, cheese dreams, mock banana, fish eyes and goo, jam tarts, rabbit blancmange, orange squash jelly, toffee carrots, honey chocolate, carrot fudge, patriotic pudding, eggless victory cake. Well, we've gone to all this trouble, but how will today's children respond to our efforts? What's your dream food? Curry. Sushi? 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 What do you think of any other English food? Oh, English breakfast. Fish and chips. Fish and chips, exactly. Or a fried <laughs> cheese sandwich. Cheese dreams are cheese and beetroot sandwiches fried in margarine. Dream or nightmare? So what do you think? Is it a dream or a nightmare? And what about you? That's your nightmare. Your dream? Yeah. Round two. And I'm not sure Allegra is going to fare so well with her dessert of the day. It's called fish eyes in goo. No. Even wartime kids had trouble with tapioca. Tapioca. Are you brave enough? Are you brave enough? <laughs> Come on, you've got to But that's not too hot. It's got some funny goo to it. <laughs> Round three. Carrots on sticks. Made from unpeeled carrots dipped in melted sugar, this was the closest most wartime children got to a lollipop. Which is a nice idea, actually, because carrots are as sweet as apples. And the thing is, if they don't work as confectionery, then we can use them as bollards. OK, now, Jamie and Co. That looks disgusting. Yeah, but give it a go. Try it. Try it. OK. Oh, wow, I love it. That's the sweetest thing I've ever eaten. Done. I dare you, go on. Don't, don't just lick it, have a bite of it. <laughs> lovely, lovely. He did some sick up there, yeah. OK, everybody, it's raffle time. I know that the rumour's gone out what the prize is. We all know how much it's at stake, it's exciting. But well, if you're not going to tell them what the prize is? No. That's got Surprise. It. It's fully, fully insured and taxed for a year. Right, and the winner is number 41. <laughs> lovely. Can we get it? After the fall of the Channel Islands in 1940, onions were so rare that they were raffled for huge sums of money. One onion, raffled at the office of the Times, raised four pounds, three shillings and fourpence, the equivalent of 130 pounds today. These were more special than PlayStation 3s or Xboxes. Actually, they weren't quite as special as PlayStation 3s. <laughs> Sue and I can't get enough of the party food, but after using an entire community's rations for one week on a single party, What's the overall verdict from our guests? Yeah, it's absolute <laughs> stuff. So stuff like I just limp there for a bit because I feel because I felt so heavy. And this is delicious. Absolutely delicious. Mmm. Mm. <laughs> it's just as I remember as a kid, yeah, just yeah. real blancmange. It's great. Yeah, I'll tell you what, I bet you on V Day there wasn't a thing left. They'd have all got it down and they'd have been so hungry they'd have eaten right the way through the lot. Again. Don't know Despite the joyousness of the occasion, many revellers felt a sense of despair on VE Day. World War II had been the bloodiest conflict in history, and it had left Britain destitute and in pieces. It's nice to have a community spirit and have all the kids running about and loads of sugar driving them mental and 
but you would. I think you'd just have this euphoria, and then as soon as you got a chance to be on your own, you just you just feel so incredibly sad. Now the war's finished, but instead there's years and years of austerity yeah, ahead of you. Not that they knew that. Course. No, but they must have had a big idea. I mean, there's, there's, there's half of London bombed out and, and no money to fix it. To get us back in the mood, Sue rallies the troops for a final fling. Right, everybody, it's time for the conga, so line up, come on, here we go. <laughs> I don't know whether the kids sort of appreciated necessarily how lucky they were to be eating carrot fudge, cultured sandwiches and weird jellies and things like that. For Sue and me, who'd just been living on, on roots, basically, roots and twigs, this was very exciting to, to have all this food. And, and also I did have a, you know, a general sense of what it would be like. I wasn't actually being bombed and I didn't lose loved ones, but you know, I had pretty dreary, crappy food all week. Uh, and it was quite exciting to get a pink jelly shaped like a rabbit. The, the beige nightmare is over, the end to reconstituted egg, uh, the end to uh, mock everything and the beginning of real something. So we'd like everyone to have a piece, a last piece of ration food. So here's to better tuck all round. What is over? in the 21st century and it's time to see what our carb-tastic week of bread and potatoes has done for our health. You've got the same oxygen level in your blood as I have now sitting at rest. Supergirl. Despite feeling fatter, Sue has actually lost two pounds and managed to run 15% further than last week. For you to come in and do that today and just, you know, surpass yourself by that much from last week, that is super. I, f I sort of felt more solid. I kind of lifted great weights and pushed lots of shape. Not, not a kind of agility, not lean and toned and sort of yeah. supple, but more like a workhorse. My potato diet may have been a shock to the system, but I've actually dropped three and a half pounds. Your overall body fat has dropped by 3.9%. As well, your lean mass has gone up by a couple of percent. That's I think it's been yeah. much more of an extreme change for you, mm. and so, for, so we've seen greater results. So what's the general verdict from Dr. Asher? Looking at the whole picture, you both have shown the same improvement in cardiovascular risk factors. Both have dropped weight. In short, you're both healthier people, and you should be in better fighting condition as a result of that, with greater endurance and stamina in one week. Great. So you can imagine what happens if you run this over a wall. I couldn't eat that many potatoes with all, with all due respect. Yeah, and that's with huge implication, presumably, for the diets of most people in, in, in 2008. After five years of rationing, Britain found that it was healthier than it had ever been. The consumption of sugar and fat having been cut by 50%, rates in heart disease, obesity and diabetes dropped to levels dramatically lower than today. I feel basically very positive about this diet because people look back on the 40s and the 50s as long as rationing went on as this time of austerity and depressing food. I think if they looked at us now and saw how fat we've become, this illusion of choice, the crisps and the chocolate, the rubbish we eat all the time, I think we're probably more miserable, more run down and less healthy than they were. I think the modern diet people think is about choice but actually it's about slavery to big brands and junk and rubbish that <clears throat> you nutritionally don't need and don't really want. Yeah, well we beat Hitler by, by eating potatoes. Next time we go back to Restoration England where we'll be struggling with snails, oh, God! peeing in chamber pots, it's got an absolutely charming foam on it, and drinking ourselves silly. I have been off my face since nine o'clock this morning. And supersizers go restoration next Tuesday at nine. Next tonight on BBC Two, Paul Weller and Martha Wainwright are late alive with Jules. Lady,